there's a long history of JFSP working with and making and JFSP as a program and JFSP researchers using land fire as, as a really critical source of information. It's, it's a substantial database, as you all know. Um, it's been around for, for over 20 years now. Um, so it's, it's a critical tool that many of our researchers access and use as they're developing, developing research projects and, and collecting data or accessing data. So by extension, for the exchanges, it's really important that you're aware of what Landfire represents as a resource and that you can, can basically tr translate that or relay that information, make it available to your constituents and the folks who are using your, your information or using, using your, your exchanges as a source of information. So it's great for us to have some face time with a team that works with Landfire. And, uh, and I don't wanna take up too much time because I've looked at their, their presentation briefly yesterday. They've got a lot of information to share. So I'm gonna just say, welcome to the team. I'm not sure who I'm turning handing this off to, if it's Dr. Smith or Inga, but uh, so I'll let you guys introduce yourselves um, and welcome. And I think everybody, please uh, pay attention and I hope we have time for a few questions. So take it away. Is that gonna be you, Inga? Thank you. I think so. Are we ready? Can you see my screen? Yep, we're ready. Yep. We can okay, see. great. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, I really appreciate uh, everyone coming on. As you know, I used to work for the Fire Science Exchange Network, so I know a lot of you. Um, so it's great to see some of your names after um, quite some time. Um, we wanted to highlight the Landfire Disturbance Product Suite um, in this presentation. It's something that I think a lot of people are less aware of. Um, but we're going to go around. I'm going to talk about who contributed to this presentation. So myself, Brian Tolk, who's our disturbance um, subject matter expert. Brenda Lumberg will be talking today, and she's our reference lead. Um, Sanat Satyachandran is going to be talking about his some of his additions to the disturbance mapping um, as a scientist with Lamfire. Josh Picot has also contributed quite a bit to our disturbance mapping. Karen Callahan is on and she is a, a, a disturbance mapping analyst. And Ray Dittmeyer has contributed quite a bit to our, our processing with the high performance computing. So these are kind of the main players with this particular um, um, presentation, but obviously there's a huge, huge team that we work with. Um, all right, so I'm going to just jump in if that's okay. Um, let me get set up here. There we go. So just a quick um, reminder of what Landfire is. Um, we are a mapping um, data source and we map every 30 meter pixel of the United States. So not only does that include vegetation and fuels, but it also includes development, roads, agriculture. So we have to assign something to every 30 meter pixel in the entire United States and we're all lands, we don't discriminate. <laughs> so we cover the conterminous US, Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico and some of the other insular areas. Um, we were established in support of the National Fire Plan and the Cohesive Strategy and chartered by um, WIFLIC in uh, 2004. And uh, we are funded by the Department of Interior Office of Wildland Fire, as well as the US Forest Service. We have partners with the Nature Conservancy and the USGS is um, in charge of the contract to create the products. So um, down at the bottom here, you can see all of our different versions. So we had Landfire National, which was sort of our base, original base map, which was circa 2001. We have a, we've had numerous updates since, um, and these updates um, are different than the base map. So then we had a new base map in um, 2016, which was our remap. A lot of folks are familiar with that. And then we had the 2019 limited update. And this um, particular presentation is gonna be focused on the Landfire 2020 release, which we released quite a bit of that earlier this week on the first. Um, so most of CONUS 
uh, with uh, the Northeast and Alaska coming uh, at the beginning of next month. So um, these are all of the spatial data layers that Lamfire offers. And these are the ones in black are the ones that are coming out with the Lamfire 2020. And, um, and it's, I think, over 30. <laughs> Most of them are raster uh, layers. So at that, you know, that pixel level, um, besides the reference, which is which are polygons, and you could actually, um, you know, get some of our plot data with our XY data as well. So um, the key here is to understand that really disturbance is the first ingredient um, to a lot of um, our update mapping. And it affects the fuels you'll find and the vegetation that you'll find in any specific location. So essentially we start with our events that, that Brenda brings in and she'll describe that in more detail. That uh, feeds into our annual disturbance layers, which feed into our, what you see for the vegetation and fuel layers. And then again, the vegetation feeds into some of our fire regime layers. So it really is kind of the basis for a lot of our updates that you see in Lamfire. Um, so what do you see? Well, um, if you have a, a disturbance, such as the one on, on the left here, this is the Soberanus fire, fire in 2016, you will see a change from the pre-fire to the post-fire vegetation cover, for example. Um, and you'll see that in the areas where it was more severe, you'll have more change, okay? So we directly use, within Lamfire, we directly use our disturbance layers to affect change in vegetation. And we do the same for fuels. Um, so you can see, again, in the, in the area of the, the highest um, severity is you'll see the most change for fuels. And these are our, our, our fuel models and, and they're used quite often in a lot of the fire behavior um, modeling. And so these are really important for when you're on a fire or when you're doing risk analyses and, that, and things of that nature. Um, but it's not the only way that we use. I don't know how to minimize this. Can you guys see that? I don't know. Anyways, it's not the only thing that uses the um, land fire disturbance data. It's, it's actually a really super useful data set uh, on its own as a standalone product. And I think that's one of the reasons I really wanted to highlight the disturbance suite is because a lot of people aren't aware that it even exists. Um, and so, so that's, that's one of the reasons I wanted to highlight this particular study you know, it's using the fire frequency derived from land fire to um, as a, as a variable in their hab habitat suitability model, um, and it and they found that it was an important variable for these uh, species in the longleaf pine um, ecosystem. So I just picked this, you know, kind of randomly, but it's just an example of how someone was able to use our disturbance layers um, in their study specifically. Um, and, and how much do we have? Well, we have annual disturbance from 1999 to 2020. Um, around the 2011, 2012 time, time period, we got a lot better at creating our imagery um, to, to map disturbance. Uh, we added Hawaii, and then, and then in 2015, we added um, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. So, um, so there are there were improvements to disturbing, disturbance mapping along the way, um, but we do have this long record available. So how do we create this product? How do we create this um, amazing uh, annual disturbance product? Um, and I'm going to go into some of those those details. Um, we have uh, we have to determine what source to use for each pixel as far as the disturbance that we're showing, right? So we have to have some sort of prioritization um, in terms of, of, of which source we're going to use for that particular pixel. And here, what we have is that the top of the pyramid sources, um, the disturbance sources, 
will actually override any of these other ones right below it. So these are the highest priority. These are the lowest priority in terms of where we're getting the information for each pixel. So first, I'm going to just describe the FIRE program and go through each of these and describe um, top down, basically. So the FIRE program data, what is that and what does that mean? Well, all of the FIRE program data, we've got the monitoring trends and burn severity, the burned area reflectance classification, and the rapid assessment of vegetation condition. So this is what we consider our FIRE program data. All of them use some form of uh, the normalized burn ratio, which essentially, uh, you know, it compares spectrally healthy vegetation versus the burned uh, vegetation and, and, and exploits the difference between the two and, and the spectrum there. And it also gives you uh, a level of severity at the same time, right? So the bigger the difference, the higher the severity. Um, <clears throat> as you know, as many of you know, MTBS um, maps, they map a thousand acre and, and larger in the west and 500 and larger in the east. Um, the bark usually has some sort of ground validation component for post-fire impacts. And, um, and the ravage is really focused on vegetation restoration, um, but, um, but they do incorporate sentinel imagery as well. So sometimes we do have to do uh, uh, focal filling and gap filling because of the fact that these, um, these fire programs um, data, the imagery, it's really focused on right before and right after the fire, right? And so sometimes it's, it, there's some, um, some disturbed, uh, what am I trying to say? There's some uh, anomalies that we have to address in the imagery. So this second bullet is really the biggest, <laughs> the biggest thing that we are dealing with in, um, in disturbance mapping for land fire. Um, and so the change means remote sensing of uh, change. And then the events are referring to essentially the polygons that everyone is asked to submit to land fire um, every year. And so, the polygons really give us an idea of um, the disturbance type, like what kind of disturbance happened there. Um, and, and it's really important information for when we're mapping changes to vegetation and fuels. Um, so Brenda is going to take over and describe uh, how we process our events. All right, so the landfire events data is a collection of disturbance and treatment polygons. Um, this slide shows the landfire events flowchart. It really gives a good overview of the event data production process. Um, landfire land puts out a yearly data call asking for disturbance and treatment polygon data, and we receive data contributions, and we also pull data from online sources. Some examples of the sources that we incorporate into our events are listed on the left of this slide. Uh, those highlighted in blue are examples of data we pull from online sources, while the ones in black are examples of data contribution. Uh, once the data sets are gathered, we then convert the, um, them into the Lampire events format, and both a raw and model-ready version of the data are created. And once all data in a geographic region are converted into a light format, we then can compile the data and produce a program version of the events. When a full suite of program version data is complete, we then generate a public version. And I'll go into more detail about some of these steps in the following slides. Uh, next slide. Each data set we receive has its own unique format and set of attributes. So we separately convert each data set into the Landfire Events format. The Landfire Events data are stored in a geodatabase, and this slide shows the Landfire Events table format. The fields highlighted in green are the data we pull from the source data set, and the unhighlighted fields are populated by Lampire. We bring through event year in the disturbance or treatment type label from the source data set, which we place in the event subtype. And that's the minimum amount of information that's required to process data. Additional information we bring through from the source data set, if it is available, include unique record IDs, name of event, start and end dates, severity, and comments. Landfire then will assign event types, unique IDs, agency, and we also assign a source code to each data set, and that connects back to citation information for each data set. Next slide. 
During the conversion process, we assign one of our Alamfire event types to the data. The list on the left shows the event types that we track and bring through into the Alamfire events data. We assign one of our event types to the event subtype, which is the treatment or disturbance label that we brought through from the source data set. The table on the right just shows some examples of this process. Next slide. Once the data have been converted into the LAM firm format, we produce a raw events layer and a model ready events layer. The raw events layer has been analyzed to eliminate geospatial or information content errors, but otherwise represents a full account of acceptable data processed by LAM fire. Basically all polygons that we process can be found within the raw events layer. These data may include multiple polygons for the same event and also a high degree of overlap between different events within a single year. For example, we may have three or four polygons for the same wildfire, or we may have you know, several seeding events within a harvest event. We also produce a model ready events layer that has been reduced to one event per year per location. In order to produce this uh, layer, topologies are created from the raw events to identify areas of overlap within the same year and then a set of decision rules are um, applied to correct the overlap. Next slide. A topology in ArcGIS can define how polygon features share coincident geometry, and there are different rules that you can apply to a topology. We apply the rule that the polygons must not overlap. So then a topology will show us which polygons overlap. Uh, the red areas on the map, for example, are areas where two or more polygons overlap. We then can use a set of decision rules to correct the overlap so we only have one event per year per location. Lampire has recently created an events topology check tool, which has automated the topology process. And this has been a huge time saver and has allowed us to process data much faster. Events data from 1999 through 2016 were topologized by hand and events data from 2017 on were processed with the events topology tool. The next few slides will go into the decision rules we use to correct the topology overlap. Next slide. The primary decision rule we use to correct topology overlap is the event type hierarchy. This is the hierarchy list and the events at the top of the list with the smallest event type code are deemed the most important because they have the greatest impact on vegetation and fuels. Where events overlap, we will keep the event with the smallest event type code. For example, if we have a wildfire polygon with an event type code of seven, overlapping a clear cut with an event type code of two, we keep the clear cut event where it overlaps with the wildfire. Next slide. If the overlapping polygons have the same event type, we then look to several other fields to determine which event to keep. The next field we look at is severity. If one event has severity and the other does not, we keep the event with severity. If both events have severity, we keep the event with the highest severity. If severity is the same for both events, we then look at end date. If one event has an end date and the other does not, we keep the event with the end date. If they both have end dates, we keep the event with the most recent end date. If end date's the same, we then look to start date. Once again, we either keep the event that has a start date or the most recent start date. If start date's the same, we'll then look at source code rank. The source code rank is populated with either a one or a two. A one is given to local data sets, which are more likely to have collected the data, and a two is given to national data sets, which are more likely to have compiled data from different agencies and units. And we keep the most local event. If the source code rank is the same, then we look at acres and we'll keep the largest event. If all the above attributes are the same, then we'll, the program will just arbitrarily pick one to keep. Once the topology is completed, we have the model ready version of the event, and is this version that is used to help develop our disturbance products. Next slide. Once program events for all region are completed, the public version of the data is developed. Sensitive or proprietary data are removed. For example, we have data sharing agreements in place with some of our data contributors, like the BIA and some state agencies. And as part of that agreement, we are asked not to release the data to the public. Therefore, the data is removed from the public version of the events. The public version of the events data then are posted on the Latin Fire website and are available for download. Next slide. The Events Geo Database is its own amazing standalone data set. And the 2017 to 2020 public version of the data was just released. From 1999 through 2020, we have collected and processed a lot of data. We have over 2 million events in the raw layer and over 1,250,000 events in the model ready layer. 
Here's a map showing the CONUS location of events from 1999 through 2020. While overall we have good coverage throughout the US, there are still some differences in reporting and we are lacking data from certain areas. For example, you can see some state outlines that are evident in this map. These are definitely areas for improvement. Uh, you can go to the next map. The second map shows the CONUS events for just 2020. And as you can see on this map, we've captured some of the very large wildfires that happened that year, including the August complex and the lightning complexes in California. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Brenda, for yeah. explaining all of that. Was, that was awesome. I think one of the things that um, happens a lot is that I see other people collecting the same data and having to clean it up. <laughs> on their own. And so I just would really encourage everyone to, to point folks to this data set first. It may not be exactly what you need for your events, but um, you know, you could probably get a good head start um, mm -hmm. in, in one way or the other. So I really encourage folks to spread the news on this events geodatabase um, data set. So, so that's the event part of this <laughs> second bullet. Now we're going to move into the change part of that second bullet. And essentially, we're talking about remote sensing of landscape change. And this is an in-house process that Landfire does um, to add to that event's um, data set. And um, again, you know, this is the second. Now we're on to the second priority here in that hierarchy. So this is our, our tile setup for, um, for remote sensing of landscape change um, for CONUS. And um, the, the key thing that you have to remember when you're doing change detection is that you actually need to have clear imagery, right? You can't compare two images if there's a bunch of clouds in one and not in the other. Um, so I'm going to show you kind of what that means. So we create image composites, and I'm going to show you this tile here and what that looks like. So if you just get Landsat imagery, you know, this is kind of what you're looking at with the overlapping scenes, the clouds, you know, and everything like that. And so we need something more like this below um, in order to um, start comparing different dates and really seeing the difference between um, two dates for, for change in spectral re reflectance. Um, we're currently using a high performance computer at USGS for, for composites. This one in particular was made in AWS Cloud, which we're um, exploring to create our composites. And so what is a composite? So in order to get that clear imagery, we, um, we uh, use this percentile composite process that Brian Tolk came up with um, specifically for our purposes. And basically what happens is that you get a range of dates. So you get scenes from a range of dates, for example, um, late June is kind of our early season um, time that we look at. So we get a range of dates around um, late June and you kind of just order the reflectance values of each pixel of each band, right? So for example, this pixel here has all of these different values. Um, you, you order those up and you get the 50th percentile and that ends up pulling out, you know, potentially a very clear image of that range of dates. So you're getting rid of all of those anomalies with cloud shadows and so on and so forth. We also do a, a 20th and a 90th percentile for each band as well. And um, the 20th, you, you know, tends to highlight the, um, the, uh, the normalized burn ratio uh, disturbances. And then the, the 90th tends to highlight the, the greenness, the NDVI disturbances. And so all of these are extremely useful um, for the analysts to look at. Um, so we, get these clear composites, we, we have clear imageries, we have early season, late season, we have different years. So we have all of these, this imagery to work with. Um, but first we do apply some automated disturbance detection um, algorithms to give us, give us a head start um, to be able to look at you know, what is actually getting disturbed on the lamp landscape. So Sanat is going to explain some of the automated ways that we detect disturbance um, with that with those composites. 
It's not you're on mute. <laughs> okay, I hope I'm audible right now. So, um, Inga, thanks, Inga, uh, for the uh, for the uh, for the the basis of remote sensing. And um, so, we're going to start with uh, looking at two clear images. On the left hand side, what you see is uh, uh, what Inga was talking about. You you compare two images. And that's how you detect a change. And for a human, I don't even have to tell you that how much of a less of green should become a change or uh, how much of this purple you see is it's a change. You kind of know it instinctively. Like, you know, a human brain can actually add a threshold or some kind of cutoff. I don't need to tell you the number. Another thing to be seeing is you do see some change which may not be changed. Uh, like some of the green things which are changing a little darker shades. And instinctively, we kind of know that these look more like an artifact or observation rather than actual real change. Now, these are two qualities which the, the automated algorithms lack. Uh, we do currently, we, at least we, uh, a few years back, we use the multi-index uh, integrated change analysis. And that's a computer-based algorithm and um, that we have to tell it what kind of a threshold to use. And that's usually used by the mean and the standard deviation. And the basic assumption is that uh, things don't change all the time. Like for example, even if uh, we did uh, Brenda and Inga, they showed you all these massive amounts of change. If you look at it from the pixel and all the pixels within the United States, uh, less than 1% actually changes. So if we make an assumption that if you take the mean and standard deviation of the whole of, this, uh, of, this, of, the, of the study area, they do kind of represent an unchanged state and the change do happen for the much less fraction. So the computer algorithms kind of rely on those hard-coded thresholds. And of course, uh, we use an early season or late season in an attempt to pick up all kinds of change which may not be associated with just phenological change. So, uh, so th two things we are lacking um, in, in any contemporary uh, change detection algorithms. How do you define the threshold? If you have a very uh, a liberal threshold, we're gonna have a lot of commission errors, that means false positives. But if you give it too strict, then we lose, we will not map all the change. Another big thing which the computers lack is uh, the lack of a contextual information. Uh, we look at one pixel at a time and then we zoom in and then we say what happened before. We don't see what's, what's the neighborhood. So how do we bring in these two? So the next slide. Uh, we talk about how we can extra extract the spatial domain information. Previously, computation of uh, spatial domain extraction was very intensive, but these days with the advent of HPC, it's a lot easier. So in the next slide, what we do is we, we try to draw polygons around each of the disturbance. And uh, we collect the statistics of each of the disturbance specific for the disturbance which the polygons are encircling. And we do this for a million polygons which on each tile. Uh, and that's a, that's a massive amount of computing power and thanks to Brian and uh, Ray for those uh, massive data crunching. And once we do this, we are now able to see what is the, the relative change, how much of a change is it with its own neighborhood. So if you go to the next slide, uh, this represents the z-scores and true detections or true change or more severe changes will be more darker and then the false changes become lighter. So this is, this is how we can bring the spatial domain information. But we're still not attacked the same first problem, like you know, how do we define the threshold? Because that's the heart of it. So the next slide, we kind of summarize what the, what the usual errors are and we know what the errors are caused due to it's because of the changing threshold and the lack of contextual information. So we developed um, um, uh, a new algorithm called the spatially adaptive filter for error reduction, now we call it SAFER. And we do incorporate some changing thresholds and the contextual information. So the first thing we do is uh, we want all the, uh, the consideration to, to be, it's a, it's a filter. So we, we do uh, try to keep a liberal threshold so that we get a little more extra commission errors. Uh, we use all the surface reflectance uh, so that the atmospheric difference, like Inga was talking about uh, compositing. And one of the first things that comes out from the compositing is also having a very clear view of the surface because it's just clouds is not the only issue. Sometimes aerosols can also be there and that gives us a much clearer. And that's where the Brian's technique of uh, having considering different percentile also uh, helps. So we use a series of um, surface reflectance and indices where Inga was talking about. Everybody uses a DNBR. Uh, that indices are designed to find disturbance in, disturbation, uh, in, in vegetation. And to top it all, we also use a spatial information, which I just explained how we do it in the safer mechanism. Um, so to decide on the threshold, here's where we rely on the previous year's results. Um, you know, Ed, in the beginning, he mentioned that it's a substantial and a critical uh, database land fire. And Inga was also talking about how comprehensive we are. We know that we're coming out a clean product and we will show you how uh, uh, we, our, our accuracy levels are really high. But the analyst reviews product is a very clean product which we disseminate to the public and we use the previous year's machine uh, uh, data to train our machine model. And once we train the machine model for this current year, we know we can map it. So it's a hybrid model uh, using the previous year's clean data to, uh, to clean up the current year's data. So it does clean up a majority of commissioners. So let's see some examples of where it works. Um, Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we're going to oh, almost wide results. I jumped over. 
So um, what you see is basically one of the uh, uh, accuracy metric. We are now comparing it with the analyst uh, review data, which is uh, standard. Um, uh, compared to that, we are going to compare um, the MICA, which is basically the, uh, the raw MICA which we were using before, and then the new procedure with the SAFER. And those are shown as the bar charts. The red ones are the MICA values, and the green ones are the, um, are the, are the SAFER values. Ideally, we want all of them to be equal to one, which is the, usually the longest side of the SAFER. So what you see is, uh, uh, SAFER does improve the, the overall accuracy um, of a given raw product, gives analysts a very head start. Uh, where it fails is somewhere in the central regions, where uh, if you look at the background land, it is either agriculture or shrubland or vegetation, uh, which is de less dense vegetation. And that, that's kind of um, uh, reconcilable because um, if you have a strong vegetation signal like a forest and when it gets deforested, you get a strong barren ground uh, signal. So from a remote sensing perspective, it's a lot easier and very accurately to identify. Whereas if, if, uh, if a very sparse land loses a leaf or, a, or loses a vegetation, that signal is much more hard to, uh, uh, to differentiate. Uh, so in the next slide, I think it's showing an example of uh, where it works. This is in the Northwest sector, I think in the state of Washington. Um, uh, yeah, on the left-hand side, you see uh, there's a lot of commissioners. All the red dots are basically the, the um, um, possible candidates of uh, disturbance which have been detected. On the right-hand side, there's a much more cleaner product which comes out from the safer. So let's just quickly zoom in on the next slide. Uh, on, the, on the lower bottom, the next uh, slide, you'll see that um, on the left-hand side is your MICA, on the right-hand side is your SAFER results, and the SAFER gives you a much more cleaner uh, product than um, on the left-hand side. So it gives you a very good head start. Now, SAFER does not work all the way. Uh, another example of where uh, uh, it's bound to fail is in the next slide. Um, this is uh, in one of the desert shrubland regions near New Mexico. On the left-hand side is a DNBR image. The dark regions are supposed to be the places where uh, the vegetation has been disturbed. And Inga just instinctively pointed out to the, to the line, and that happens because the humans immediately will perceive this line, whereas on the, on the right-hand side, you see the computers, how miserably they fail when it comes to identifying basic structures, because um, uh, lines is something, it, it takes a much level, higher level of cognition. Hopefully at some point when we use AI, we might come to this, but as of now, uh, we have to rely on the analyst to fill in this particular gap. So uh, overall, SAFER has reduced the uh, effort by the analysts. So their, their expertise is used for much more critical jobs. And, uh, and that's where their expertise is. And then we take the feedbacks and we continuously improve this um, algorithm. So with that, I think I'll give it mic back to Inga. I think we can proceed ahead with uh, the analyst. Yeah, so um, so we have the, the, the MICA, we have the SAFER, we have DMVR, DMDVI. Um, and so the, the analyst that is going through each of these tiles, they have all of those resources to look at. Um, and typically um, they'll go in and they'll look at the disturbance and they'll say, yes, I think that's real or no, that's just an anomaly from the imagery. Um, and they use all of these resources to determine that. Uh, they also look at other you know, things like Google Earth imagery or, you know, so there's a lot of ways that they try to confirm or, you know, or deny that something was a disturbance. And so, so this is what our disturbance mapping analysts do. So here, you know, they typically start out with this, the safer results now, um, because that's been really helpful improvement. And um, they look at that before and after. Um, and, and you'll see the safer results there in red, but you can see that there might be something there that, um, that it didn't pick up. And so that's where the analyst comes in and um, they can kind of capture the stuff that may have been missed. In this case, um, they were able to pull in the DMBR um, uh, at a certain threshold and draw a polygon around that and include those pixels in, in our disturbed area. Um, and in this example, the area is stable um, until an event in 2019. And then here we were, we still had 2020 available to sort of confirm that it does look like something actually happened there. Um, and our safer, again, it, it's indicating that something happened, right? So it, it draws the analyst's eye to that area to begin with. Um, but it doesn't, doesn't quite cover all of what looks like the disturbance there. So the analyst has to look to some of the other layers um, 
to try to find a good fit um, for that area. Or if they can't find a good fit, then they end up drawing the boundary manually. So um, in this case, um, the analyst looked at all of these different layers, the DMVR, NDVI, and this um, percentile mica layer that Brian Tope developed. Um, and essentially uh, found that that P mica was, was the best fit in this case for that disturbance. And, and what that is, is essentially using all of those percentiles that, that we were talking about, um, run it through that mica process um, and, and creating an index and basically a value from zero to 10, where zero is like no change was found in any of those layers. And 10 is where change was found in all of those different layers. Um, and so the analyst can basically adjust the threshold here from zero to 10 to best fit what they're seeing in the imagery um, and then capture the polygon to be added. Um, and so it, it'll pull in those pixels as the disturbance. And here you can see the final map is it, it, it doesn't look quite the same as the P mica because we do have that 50 pixel uh, minimum filtering uh, at the very end for the remote sensing of landscape change. So this is what takes a while <laughs> in Lampfire, right? We actually have folks looking at it. Um, and so I think it's really important to remember that that human aspect is a really uh, a, a real benefit to the land fire disturbance data set. <clears throat> and that follows through to the end. So <clears throat> we went through this second bullet and these last three um, are basically variations of that. Right. So um, so we if if we detect landscape change um, in the remote sensing within 500 meters of, event, of an event, we label that pixel um, with you know, that event type and, and that it was within 500 meters. Just for the user's information, maybe it could have been part of that event. We don't know, right? Um, then you have the next level down is when we have an event um, from, from Brenda's uh, geo database, um, compilation, but we can't, we're not seeing any remote sensing of change, right? So that's that next level. Um, and typically those events um, get labeled with like a low severity, right? Um, and then the lowest priority is where we have change, but we have no event to go with it at all. Um, but we do use other data sets to inform that, and those are considered our unknown disturbances. Um, but we do, do use things like the protected area database and the burned area um, product to inform some of those unknown disturbances. Um, <clears throat> and, and the burned area product is, um, is uh, that, that process that Todd Hawbaker uses with uh, Landsat ARD uh, imagery. He's got all kinds of machine learning and temporal information. Um, to create the burned area data set. And that's available, <clears throat> I think, with, you know, near the Landsat data there. And then um, Josh Picot, who's another one of the Landfire scientists, um, had created a value added procedure for the burned area data. And it uses the MODIS, the VIRS, the GOES, active fire detections, all different um, um, kind of ways to detect uh, fire occurrence via satellite imagery to basically corroborate the burned area product and the, uh, the date and the location of the disturbance. So that's, this is a great, you know, sort of additional piece of information that we can uh, uh, label that pixel with, right? And so um, if, if, uh, if fuels sees that the that it was a burned area um, pixel, then they will pull that into the fire um, fuel rules, right? So they'll consider that as a fire. Um, so here's the final product for 2020. Um, I um, when I mapped this, I mapped it by disturbance type. Okay, so um, you can you can see kind of the general. Um, uh, disturbance pattern for 2020. We obviously had a lot of fires there out west that um, that we pointed out earlier. Um, and then, you know, I'm going to 
focus in on some of these patterns here in a second, but I think the key here is to re remember that each of those pixels has a lot of attributes with it. So, um, you know, I mapped it based on disturbance type, but you can map it based on severity, right? You can map it based on what source it came from. Um, and so all of that information comes with each of those pixels of disturbance. And, and I think that's where, you know, if you are trying to do some statistics uh, on, on um, disturbance through the years, that would be a really great way to delve into that information. Um, and then here we have the uh, 10 years of our annual disturbance um, products kind of mushed all together. And this is our historical disturbance product. Um, <clears throat> and wow, do we see some patterns there or what? You know, so this would be a really great way to kind of look at some of the disturbance history um, and how things have changed through the years. And just to kind of zoom in on a few areas in the Southeast, um, we do have a lot of those unknown disturbances. Those are the ones that were only detected with the uh, remote sensing of landscape change within land fire. Um, but some of them do would have the burned area information with it um, and, and others would not, and in which case they're considered by fuels as a mechanical remove, right? So that's kind of the default in the Southeast. Um, but you can see a lot of patterns. You can see um, big cypress in the Everglades with the fire. You can see um, tornado tracks. <laughs> you can see uh, the Mississippi where not a lot's going on, um, some insects. Um, so lots of things going on in the Southeast, but this is where I think the remote sensing of landscape change is really important. I think in the Southeast, that's a big one. In the Northwest, um, again, you can see um, in the Cascades, the, the remote sensing of landscape change um, becomes important, but man, did the Northwest get <laughs> get battered by fire in the last 10 years. And then you can also see in the in the um, the purple here, the insect um, reports that we we got as well. So um, so just a lot of information if you are interested in a certain region about what really has been going on um, in that area. Um, and again, you know, the statistics that you can derive from these um, layers, I think, are, are really kind of endless. Um, so, you know, we met this, this disturbance. We think it's correct. Um, we think it's good, but how do we know? And so Sanat has done some um, accuracy assessment work recently. And so he's gonna talk about that. Thanks Inga. Yeah, so Inga gave you an overview about, uh, Inga and Brenda and myself, we can give you an overview about how the distance product is actually created the amount of effort that goes into it. And of course, uh, we need some accuracy measures. And um, to measure something, uh, to ac have an accuracy measure, we need some kind of an external independent reference data. Lucky for us, the LC map, which is another flagship uh, USGS program, uh, land change monitoring um, assessment and projection from the, uh, from USGS, they have a reference data set that basically uses uh, expert opinion for single pixels uh, going from 1984 to 2018. If you can advance the slide. Uh, there are roughly about 25,000 points um, over corners. These are, um, uh, they are revisited every year from 1984 to 2018. And um, a panel of judges or expert opinion, people who have experience watching and interpreting what has happened. Uh, they interpret the change. They even try to ascertain the cause of change uh, to each of these pixels. And of course the interpreter agreement, as uh, you will see again, uh, it is not that easy to look at remote sensing uh, images because there are uh, other things that can confound judgment. Interpreter, interpreter agreement was not 100%, it was 88% for overall. And especially, especially if you just consider just a change, um, what constitutes a change itself is a little uh, tricky to describe. It's only about 50% of them, uh, they concur. But nevertheless, we now have an independent data set with which we can actually compare um, the land fire change product accuracies. So in the next slide, uh, what I've shown is again, the, uh, one of the change metrics, the kappa. And what you see there on the x-axis of the years, we analyzed it for 2013 to 17. And uh, uh, we know that the 100% agreement is not expected. And uh, we do see uh, uh, quite a good high cop out between a 0 0.5, 0 0.4 to a 0.6. And of course, that is not the only way to measure accuracies. There's a lot of different ways to measure accuracies. If you advance to the next slide, uh, we will see the overall accuracies on the, on the secondary y-axis on the right-hand side. 
And uh, you see the top, the dashed line is basically our overall accuracy. It's very close to 100%. It's, uh, it's about 98% and higher. Uh, what is shown on the red lines is basic red and the green lines. Uh, the red lines are basically uh, talking about the disturbed class. Uh, that is our users, uh, uh, omission errors and commission errors with respect to the, uh, to the reference uh, data set. Uh, for change, we are roughly around in the 50% category. That's roughly around the same time where the, uh, the interpreters also had a disagreement. So we're not terribly worried about that. Uh, and then the, your omission errors and commission errors for no change, it's much less than 1%. So I think um, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's good. That, that attests to the fact of this long chain and then the final QA by our analysts. That's, that's, that's a big attestment. So the, we can do this on overall corners. What about regional accuracies? In the next slide, um, uh, we do see the, the regional accuracies. Uh, There's how we see the background, but then if you go to the advanced, yep, thank you. Uh, uh, the darker shades are uh, uh, more accurate than the lighter shades, and you do tend to see a lighter shade in the in the central regions, and that is something which is very inevitable with remote sensing, uh, because we need to observe a strong signal to observe a change, and these are the places where the vegetation signals itself are not very strong, um, and then that's why. Uh, that some of the changes, uh, some of the central regions, especially in the agriculture regions, the cropland regions, um, the shrub and bushland, uh, we our accuracies for change is low, but we are accuracies are very high uh, where there are forests and where there are thicker and denser vegetation. So I think uh, I can conclude here with and give the mic back to Inga. Yeah. So um, I think the the point here being is that um, we feel pretty good about our product. Uh, I think that it's um, great to have these accuracy. Uh, statistics to go with it now as well. Um, where, uh, oh, you already said that. <laughs> where are we going, right? So where is Lampfire headed? And specifically, where is the disturbance mapping headed? Um, so we are just releasing now four years of disturbance, 2017 through 2020, um, <clears throat> and releasing that in 2022. But what do we want to do? Well, we want to get to the point where we can release disturbances um, that happened the season before, right? So um, the goal is to decrease latency, increase frequency, and include fewer years of disturbance as we go forward. And so our, our next goal is um, to include 20 year 2021 and 2022 um, and release that during 2023. And then after that, it would just be one year every year after that. So that's the goal. <laughs> um, and we're, you know, in the throes of planning and everything right now. Um, but I think the, the point here is that the importance of getting some of the fire program data um, in time to be useful, as well as the events and time to be useful is going to increase, right? So the, the importance of getting those, those data in um, to Lampfire so that we can include it is going to uh, increase as we move forward, okay? Um, and that's all I have. I wanted to acknowledge the entire Lampfire disturbance team, all of our partners, cooperators, contractors. Um, I wanna mention Tim Hatton, who is our USGS, program manager, Marcy Heiser, who's a task manager with the contract that I'm on, um, Henry Bastian, Jim Minakis, and Jim Smith, who are part of our business leadership. Um, and I have my email, the help desk, and where you can download data on the website. Um, we do have a new viewer and data download site, which is really slick and awesome that um, you should totally check out. Um, we also have the full extent mosaics of the Conterminous US. Um, and then we also have a Lampfire product service now, which is an API way to access our data. So we've got lots of ways to get it. Um, these are our slides from, from um, Megan. And they, you know, we have the Lampfire brief that you can sign up to, um, the Twitter, uh, the YouTube channel, and of course our website. And then um, we also have office hours, which I have found to be really interesting and useful. So um, we usually have a featured Lampfire user who has a specific question or topic that they wish, you know, that they want to talk about. Um, but it's typically pretty free form and we will, uh, there will be a lot of experts on the call to help you answer your questions. So I think that's all I have, Karen. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I appreciate that. Thanks, Inga. Thanks, Sanath mm -hmm. and Brenda and the TNC team. Um, really appreciate the level of detail. This is really great to see this information as well as the example. So we have about six minutes for questions and we'll do a quick poll. So if folks want to just come off, um, come off mute or raise their hands, um, we have some time for questions now. So no questions. Let me just uh, say that Tim Hatton has been, uh, Tim has, has been sharing some useful info in the chat. Great. Perfect. Any questions or feedback for the team? We see some information about office hours being populated in there. That's great. Okay, we have a question from uh, Jenny Sanat. What areas did you say were the most difficult to detect change? Well, usually if things don't have a strong vegetation signal, if uh, like for example, desert lands, um, if you have a, a small speck of vegetation full of barren land, and if you lose the vegetation, uh, we don't see a, sig a good signal to noise. So that's usually the first reason why we don't detect. Another sometime reason is because of the way we composite, we might miss if there's a grassland fire, it might recover. So these are the two things which we consistently see as a little more difficult to detect. Hope Great. That answers the question. Yep, perfect. Thank you, Sanat. Thanks, Jenny. Any other questions? And again, if folks want to come off mute, you're welcome to do that or raise your hand for any questions or comments. Um, question from Joe. What's the source of historical fire regime information? So we do have our, um, our BPS layers, which have the fire return interval. Um, these are all considered um, pre-European settlement. Um, so we have the mean fire return, we have the percent low severity, moderate and high severity, all with that um, biophysical setting uh, um, layer in the fire regime. Great, and Henry um, added a comment here. Inga shared an example of where these disturbance products have been applied. Is there a place where we can go and find other examples? Um, I mean, you know, if you just look at a, at the our fuels layers, you'll see um, where the disturbances have affected um, what fuels you see there in those layers. Um, but um, but yeah, I don't. We I think that we should get more examples of those, right? <laughs> and more graphics. I think that would be good. Yeah, absolutely. And Tim added um, other ways that folks can go in and get some data. So go ahead and take a look at that link. We have time for another question or comment from the group. So again, if folks wanna come off mute or raise your hand or add any comments in the chat box. Oh, I think Joe was trying to get at like, where are we getting that historical information? So maybe Corey or Jim could jump in for that. Oh, um, I'll, I'll start with uh, Corey. Corey can certainly jump in. So Joe, those are all our outputs of the state and transition simulation models that were created for each of the biophysical settings, which are based on ecological systems. So we went out to local workshops and regional workshops and had experts come in and help us build those models. And the outputs of those models are where the percent different severities and the mean fire return interval pre-European settlement, that's where, the, where those values come from. So they're model outputs. And those models are downloadable uh, from Landfire, both the model as well as the description. So I think I know where Joe's coming from. Like he, you know, they have all of the fire scar data yeah. and the, um, the, the cores and everything, so. Um, yeah, so, I saw your webinar yesterday, Joe. So oh, I, I yeah. did see that. Um, and uh, it is one of the sources that experts used to create some of those values. Uh, the thing to remember about those is, is they're, they're fairly coarse scale. Of course, they're not, um, they're not for a landscape. They might be for the entire Ozark Highlands or the Ozark um, or something, you know, so uh, we can talk more about those uh, estimates as, as you need, as you're interested in. Thank you. Uh, I've always just been super curious about the background of that information and um, wondering if the uh, 
guy at PC two FM. Uh, 30 meter gridded data if there was any application there um, no these these were all on our spatial products are just attributes attached to the biophysical setting model so there was no independent mapping of say fire return interval but the pc2m all guyettes work you know charles lafon you know university of arizona all all those uh materials are generally cited in the different models that were used to create those values, but they are not separately mapped. They're attributes of biophysical setting. Does that make sense, Joe? Okay. Wonderful. Well, thanks, Jim. And we have time for one more question before we close out with a poll. Good comment from Tim in here. I'll just reiterate that our disturbance data is an amazing data set is and is underutilized so many potential applications. Yeah, I agree. I think there's some really great um, information in here and would be great to track, you know, how a lot of this is being applied. So, yeah, and I'm just reiterating just what was said in this presentation. Uh, it, it, it truly is a tremendous data set. I just wanted to give a plug too that at the upcoming PCORA conference this fall, we are going to be having a special session that will involve land fire, LC map and NLCD and some of our change detection work there and our prototyping work for image-based updates is going to be highlighted. So for those of you, you know, into the uh, techie side of remote sensing and 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 the science, uh, or or anyone else, drop by, check it out. <laughs>